ഹായ് എവരി വൺ താങ്ക് യു ഫോർ ജോയിനിങ് യു എ ഇ വിമക് വെർച്വൽ ഇവൻറ്റ് മൈ സെൽഫ് രാജേഷ് രാധാകൃഷ്ണൻ വൺ ഓഫ് ദ യു എ ഇ വിമക് ലീഡർ ദിസ് ഈസ് അവർ സെക്കൻഡ് വെർച്വൽ ഇവൻറ്റ് ഫോർ ദിസ് ഇയർ ആൻഡ് ടുഡേ വി ആർ ഗോയിങ് ടു ഡിസ്കസ് അബൌട്ട് എൻ എസ് എക്സ്റ്റി ത്രീ ഡോട്ട് ഓ ആൻഡ് അവർ സ്പീക്കേഴ്സ് ആർ മിസ്റ്റർ ക്യൂൻറ്റൻ ആൻഡ് മൊഹമ്മദ് കൈൻഡ്ലി ഫോളോസ് ഓൺ അവർ സോഷ്യൽ മീഡിയ പേജസ് ഫോർ ഇവൻറ്റ്സ് അനൗൺസ്മെൻറ്റ് ആൻഡ് അപ്ഡേറ്റ്സ് വി ആർ പ്ലാനിങ് series of webinars on coming month to plan and schedule those virtual events kindly complete the poll which will be available after the event now i will hand over to quinton to start the session thank you for joining my name is quinton uh, i'm the nsx lead pre sales for uae uh, my colleague muhammad hadad is joining me he is the nsx lead for metna region so the both of us uh, come from a networking background i'm sure we've met most of you guys somewhere in the field uh, today's session as it says we want to give you a quick update on nsx 3.0 uh, it was officially released uh, this month and it's another one of those huge releases with a lot of new features and functionality and benefits to you and your customers So let's kick off. So the agenda as I'll do a quick introduction on 3.0, uh, I will then do uh, some overview on the capabilities we have done in the networking side and cloud scale and then Muhammad will do the security updates so focus on the security features in uh, 3.0 followed by a, a demo that we have set up in our lab. If you have any questions uh, please post them in the Q&A box while I am talking Muhammad will respond while he's presenting I will respond if there's questions that we cannot answer we'll take a note of it and send it back with the uh, via the Vimac channel cool. so I want to start off with just uh, enforcing the strength of the VMware NSX platform and how this platform has actually grown in the last I would say 4 to 5 years I've been in VMware now this month actually been 4 years when I started working with NSX and when I started with NSX I thought man what an easy job that I'm going to have what an easy task with these better features and functions that we have available in the platform but uh, the company had an aggressive goal to be the platform that is going to be capable of delivering services on virtual environment be it vmware be it kvm right to the cloud to multi workloads a typical vision slide that makes you think when does it ever end but fast forward to where we are today and honestly we have delivered on what is a full function platform So NSX gives you switching, routing, firewalling, IDS, which you'll be introduced tonight, uh, load balancing slash WAF via the acquisition of AVI, service mesh capabilities, and monitoring analytics. Now, if we go and compare this to our competitors, sure, everybody has a piece somewhere. This is just looking at the virtual machine world. So the traditional... workloads that we are all capable or all uh, used to dealing with so if we expand that to what is happening in the application world and looking at where all the cloud native applications is going we see a totally different mix of vendors now some of the guys in the traditional vendors are playing around in some of these pieces but you will see that you as a end user or as a administrator you will be exposed to a whole bunch of new tools which most of us have probably not even seen of or not even heard of and all of these are individually managed and monitored and worked through so nsx is that platform that's going to give you the end to end uh, stack fully automated via aut- our automation tools or via open automation tools that you may choose from so definitely a fully capable platform today and uh, something definitely that we are proud of in VMware and definitely to put our name behind so let's look at uh, the VMware as a NSBU so we have an, what is called network and security business unit 
we have a few products or solutions that are actually now part of the NSX portfolio. We used to just talk about NSX data center here on the bottom left, and that was the networking and security stack. We moved into NSX cloud, NSX intelligence, distributed IDS, which we're going to launch today, and a bunch of other features and functions that are now part of our portfolio. The session for today and the actual 3.0 release is focusing on these four blocks here. We are not going to cover everything in detail. The idea is to have an overview of the key features and then follow up sessions where we will take potentially security as a, as a one or two hour use case and then go much deeper into the details of what you're going to see. So if you haven't seen the release notes, this is quite a busy slide, but it just shows you how big uh, 3.0 is as a release for VMware. I'm going to cover the multi-site federation piece. I will cover a little bit on this layer three edge, some of the functions that's coming out. And Mohammed is going to cover this distributed IDS. He will cover the bare metal piece. What does that mean from NSX standpoint? We now have a micro segmentation planning tool uh, inside NSX T. Uh, Mohammed will cover a little bit of that. What you'll notice here is uh, some features and functions that might have been missing or things you've been waiting for. One of these is uh, LDAP. So you can now do direct LDAP integration from NSX Manager instead of having to go via VIDM. Another key change here is the converged VDS. So using vSphere 7, we use VDS only. Mohammed is going to give you more details on that. Uh, another very nice tool yeah, is this network uh, topology visualization. I will actually show you this in the demo. Uh, what else here that stands out? Something on the far top right, distributed load balancing. Today, this is only supported in the container environment. So you'll see this in the data sheet. Uh, if we look at, uh, there was another feature in the security. Another one here that Mohammed will cover, which is also new in 3.0, URL categorization and reputation scores. So you can see there's a bunch of new stuff that has come out and some stuff that is totally new features like layer three multipass, the IDS. But yeah, we will get into more details as the product or as we get more sessions going. So one thing I want to touch as well, uh, there's been a change or an update in the licensing SKUs or packaging of the bundles. We still have standard professional advanced and enterprise plus like you're used to in the last sort of two years, but we have shuffled some features around and you'll now see that uh, what used to be in enterprise plus the stateful layer seven EFW capabilities, that is now moved into the advanced license. The URL whitelisting is moved into, is uh, in advanced license. Uh, some of the VRF uh, functions I'm going to show you that sits in advanced, not mentioned here. But the key to notice here is also the distributed IDA or IPS IDS license. This is an add-on license. It is not built into any of the SKUs. You have to have a minimum of advanced or enterprise plus to actually use this functionality on your hosts. And we will talk about how is it, in, uh, how is it functionally coming to life. Uh, in Enterprise Plus, what has been added to Enterprise Plus is federation. So I'm going to show you what is federation. Federation requires a minimum of Enterprise Plus license on all the hosts. Another feature that is not mentioned yet that is in Enterprise Plus is the uh, L3 uh, EVPN function. Or L2 EVP, sorry. Cool. Federation. Sorry, I just want to move this bar on my screen. So federation main address or challenge that it's addressing is that if you think in NSX V, we had what was called cross V center, and uh, it was very good for the cross-site networking, stretching networks, universal objects. But there was always challenges with the actual recovery of the managers, uh, the security policy limitations of using tags and IP addresses was not liked by many customers. 
what you will find in NSX and Federation, all of that goes out the window. You now have full support and functionality on the security profiles. Uh, you can mix and match security groups, local objects, global objects. So what we've done is we've introduced this role of a global manager and your on-prem or your local ma uh, site NSX manager is now to refer to as the local manager. So this is going to give you the consistent policy mm -hmm. and security enforcement across sites. So one thing to note here in 3.0, we do not support uh, VMC as an endpoint. This will come in a future release and the same for NSX cloud. So let's see how does this work. We deploy the global managers in a cluster. The admin will configure the security policy from the global manager. And depending on how you've created the groups, you can decide if that group is stretched across one location, two locations, or all the locations. So you have that flexibility. But you're going to do the configuration centrally from one place. And then NSX manager will put, or the global manager will push that out to the local managers. And then that security policy will be enforced. So you don't have to do any policy replication or anything like that. And I will show you in the demo later what this actually looks like. From a disaster recovery standpoint, the target is to have an active uh, global manager. It is configuring the local managers. If the local manager fails, it will just switch and configure the other local managers on the, or continue to configure the local managers on the remote side via the active manager. The workloads would move, it'd be recovered with SRM or whatever tools you're using. If the actual active global manager uh, fails, you will connect via the DR manager. The active global manager will be constantly replicating the configurations to the standby uh, global manager. This feature and function is not available in NSX 3.0 today. In 3.0, we are positioning federation for customers to test it, to actually get used to the functionality, and we will improve the software, the stability, as well as the standby global manager in the next release or the subsequent release. So to better understand what are the components, you will start off deploying your local managers, which has the local control plane in each of your locations. Same as what we did with NSXV and Cross vCenter. You had a local NSX manager per site. But then we'll also deploy these global managers. This is again a cluster of three VMs per site. So in total in this diagram, you could have six VMs per site, three doing local manager and three doing the global manager. So let me just show you what this looks like. So what is the benefits of federation? What is it that we are trying to uh, address? One is consistent policy across locations but also give you this in a single pane of glass and then simplify the DR architecture. Now NSX uh, initially, when it came out in 2.0 or even 1.0, there was no uh, multi-site uh, offering or solution. As the solution scaled in 2.4, 2.5, we improved that. And now in 3.0, I think we're at the final utopia with federation. So what is available in 3.0, and this is what I have set, in the, set up in my lab, is a single manager or global manager in one site with the local managers spread across multiple sites. The first use case can be just uh, doing micro segmentation, so just security. There's no overlay networks happening here. So this is just synchronizing my security policy across multiple managers. There is now a communication that is actually happening from the local manager standpoint between locations that is sharing security objects between them. So there's a new channel of communication happening between the local managers. And then obviously the second use case is adding the routing to that. So in my lab or my demo that I will show you later, 
my topology looks very similar to this, except that I have two sides. So a stretch T0, P1 stretch, and some workflows connected to that with a synchronized security policy. So the next feature and function I'm going to talk about is uh, VRF light. Uh, if you come from a networking background, you'll know you have this concept of VRF light or VRF in the MPLS world. VRF light is the same, except that you don't have MP, BGP, and uh, uh, at least labels being shared. So what happens in this case, uh, prior to NF uh, VRF light today, if you had uh, multiple T zeros, you could actually create a distributed T zero architecture for a multi-tenancy environment or you would deploy a T0 with a dedicated edge cluster per tenant. So in this picture here, yeah, that blue T0 for tenant A would be one or two edge nodes. The green tenant would be another two edge nodes and so it would add on. So what we are doing here yeah, is giving us specifically for multi-tenancy requirements or potentially tenant A and tenant B could be the DMZ and the production network. So what we are doing is we are pushing the VRF configuration down to the T0 level. And actually slicing that T0 to be multi-tenant awareness. So now that uplinks from the T0 on the same edge device is actually having a trunk uplink to the physical network. And each sub interface represents a tenant slash VRF. So now in my uh, diagram here, you'll see the two blue links and the two green links. These can be four different VLANs. Two, the two blue lines are on one VRF and the two green lines on a different VRF. Now i am reduced the amount of footprint of edge VMs that I was using to actually uh, do this. You can see uh, the scale is 100 VRFs per T0. So 100 tenants before would have been at least 200 edge appliances with 100 uh, edge clusters, assuming that you're doing some HA functionality. Cool, so I'm going to pass over to Haddad at this point, and then I will show you some of this in the demo a little bit later. I'll continue to take the questions on the chat. Guys, please send the questions on the Q&A and not, uh, or not directly to me as private message because I would not see it while I'm presenting and the same for Haddad. Okay, guys, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yeah, perfect. So guys, as uh, Quentin have said, we have a huge list of features. I will not be able to, I mean, cover everything within 40 or 30 minutes from now. But I'm going to focus on the one that I have marked in, uh, in, um, in red. So these ones, I'm going to go a little bit more deeper in, in, with them. But for NSX micro segmentation planning with NSX intelligence, we have uh, introduced some improvements in the NSX intelligence when we do micro segmentation planning. And now NSX intelligence 1.1 is not only supported on NSX 3.0, even if the customer have NSX 2.5, they can actually deploy NSX intelligence 1.1 virtual appliance because there's no major enhancements or I would say no major change in the NSX intelligence. But in the next version, we will see a lot of many, many improvements in NSX intelligence can be supported on 3.0. But for 1.1, it's now supported in 2.5 NSX T and 3.0 NSX T. As Quentin has mentioned, now we have RBAC is back. So we can now do RBAC without even having the IDM. That's very important piece that we, we're going to have in, inside NSX 3.0 that we didn't have. I'm going to discuss the BBS alarmed license enforcement. But one thing I would like to note as well for the NSX cloud, now we can actually do app ID and URL filtering and layer seven for NSX cloud. So if you have a customer that's gonna deploy a native Azure, native AWS, we will be able to push an agent and that agent can do micro segmentation with, with application ID, so it's layer seven, stateful, 
and it will support your L3. Another thing we're adding, sorry, we're adding for the cloud part is the public cloud gateway that we now introduce in 3.0 can be actually used for VPN termination. So it can do lay 3 VPN termination. It can run the GP over that lay 3 VPN. And not only this, it can go up to 10 gig of throughput. So that's very important for you guys. If Satam is going to be deploying in Azure or AWS, they don't actually have to go and buy any third party or any VPN server. They can use the public cloud gateway, which is the same gateway you deploy for managing the cloud instances. You're going to be using it for VPN. Okay, these are the things I want to pull out, and now I'm going to go into more deeper details about the security. So, the first thing we're going to, the major thing I would say in security is IDS. And we know that we have distributed firewalling. But what we are trying to do is right now is add IDS capabilities. So, NSX T3.0 will be only IDS, but in the future release, you'll see also IDS. And the reason we're adding this is because we need to also lock down the lateral scanning and lateral attacks that are happening within the same segment. So with distributed firewalling, you can also block certain traffic. But let's say if the customer have allowed, for example, uh, port 80 within the web server's environment, that attacker can actually try to find a day zero attack. And then using that day zero attack, they will be able to leverage port 80, and then they can start doing scanning and doing some other stuff. So intrusion prevention or intrusion detection system will help us actually track and actually block in the future any type of attacks or scanning that's happening. Bare metal servers, we, we have listened to many customers that they are asking us why we don't have bare metal servers. We have added Windows 2016 support. Now we're gonna add also 2019 in the current future. We're not gonna stop here. So we're trying to put as well Windows 2012. We have pushed it to the VU, but we still don't have a definite answer It's gonna have 2012. But starting 2016 and beyond, we start adding more and more operating system from a Windows perspective. And then we're going to go identity firewall your analysis. I'm going to go deeper into these things. And then I'm going to talk about what we have done in terms of operation improvements. We have done some improvement in the operation of the micro segmentation. And then we're going to go also into the guest introspection or network introspection that we have improved in NSXT. So first of all, let's start with the micro segmentation. As you know, with NSXT, we used to have the possibility to actually just deploy NSX manager prep the servers for ES, for vSphere, so for NSX, sorry. And then you can do micro segmentation. So you can do VLAN-backed segmentation. In NSX T 2.5, it's also possible to do VLAN-backed micro segmentation, but was a bit complex for customers that have brownfield or they don't know much about NSX. So one of the things we have done is in NSX 2.5, we can either use NVDS and then use VLAN-backed segments and then we have the gateway on the underlay, but we actually do micro segmentation because now the segment living is in NSX. Or now we in NSX 3.0, we can actually use the same VDS. So we don't have to create an MVDS. We can actually use VDS that is created by the system admin or it's already created by the system vCenter admin. We're just going to use the same VDS to do VLAN back micro segmentation. So we have the two options right now, but going forward, my advice and the VU vision is that we're gonna duplicate the NVDS because it's causing more complication that's not necessary and unneeded for NSX. So going forward, if you're gonna deploy a new deployment, try to go with VDS version seven. The only thing is VDS version seven is supported on vSphere version seven. So if the customer have a 6.7 U3, we'll not be able to use VDS. We have to go and use NVDS. So one of the things you'll find in the new GUI of the, of the uh, NSX T3.0 then we have a new tab, and that tab is a wizard that helps a customer that wants only to do micro segmentation to prep the servers in this very small wizard. So it will be a wizard where you get go get started, select the cluster, it will be prepped with the uh, micro with the, the NSX libraries. Then he will have to create a segment VLAN back, and then he start the micro segmentation. So now we're trying to make it easier for customers that want to do only micro segmentation, and they don't have the big knowledge about how to use which uplinks and so on. That wizard will make it easier for them to deploy and prep the clusters for uh, micro segmentation. So what you do is actually you go to the wizard, you select the cluster. Once you select the cluster, it will be prepped. When you select the cluster, actually, it will ask you which uplinks you're gonna use. And usually we'll use the same VDS uplink. So if you have VDS level seven and you're using, for example, VMNIC zero and one, 
we just use the same mix. So there's no migration for the VM kernels, there's nothing at all. We're just gonna tell NSX use the same VDS that we have in the VC environment. Once the cluster is prepped, there's a wizard that tells the customer how to create a segment. And once you create a segment, the vCenter admin will look into the vCenter, move the VMs, and then the security admin will start to be able to do security policy. So that is mainly a wizard for a basic micro-segmentation VLAN back that for customer to make it easier for them. Now on the identity firewall updates, now we support authentication or domain control in Windows 2019. That was not possible for NSX 3.0. We still need the drivers to be installed, the introspection and network introspection to do identity firewalling. From enforcement perspective, we only support 2000 and up to 2016 and not beyond. So in the future, you'll see also enforcement being applied on 2019, Windows 2019 server. Right now, we're supporting 2019 server only for authentication. In the future, you'll see it also for enforcement on VDI or on RBSH or also on, uh, on the server standalone and deployment. Now, traditional IPS, just one more note about this. Uh, this On the VDI environment, we support Windows 2019, and also we support ICMP, UDP, and TCP uh, policies. For RDSH, we're gonna support only TCP and UDP uh, policies. If we create an ICMP rule, it's not gonna uh, be applied. It's gonna be only supporting RDSH, TCP, and UDP rules. However, VDI will support all the protocols. Now, IPS. We all know that IPS is a very, indeed, uh, uh, I would say, very primary function inside the data center. However, the problem of IDS, physical IDS, is you need to herpin the traffic to the IDS. So if you don't herpin the traffic to the IDS, you'll not be able to inspect the traffic. But if you want to install an IDS for a data center, you end up having an IDS sitting somewhere on the concentration point, where it's very close to the core or to the firewall or inside the firewall as a sound function inside the firewall in a data center. Now the problem you face is a throughput because if you're gonna push everything through the IPS, then the IPS have a limitation on the throughput. You're limiting all your 40 and 10 gig connections to be only limited to the IPS throughput. So what, handed, when, what customers end up with is just selecting certain traffic to be inspected, leaving other unnecessary or let's say less crucial traffic not to be inspected. And the other thing is the lack of vMotion. So when you move a VM from one location to the other, or from one DC to the other, for example, the IDS doesn't sync between the appliances. So some of the IDS vendors, they don't have a sync table between the IDS. So if one IDS goes down, everything, the sessions have to reestablish, and then they have to do inspection on the second appliance that is in the data center. What we are trying to do with NSX IDS is take this IDS functionality and put it inside the hypervisor. It's gonna be a distributed IDS in the, in the meantime, in the future, it's gonna be IDS and IPS. So we're gonna have inside the hypervisor a stateful table and a flow table dedicated for IPS so that any traffic going to that DM will be inspected based on a profile that you apply to the hosts. So in that case, you can now scale your VMs easily. You can move your VMs from one host to the other and you're not gonna have any drops in the traffic if you vMotion the DM from one host to the other because everything is applied in the kernel and we have a stateful or a flow table that's also gonna be migrated with the DM when you move it from one host to the other. So the way we do it is actually we have we create a profile for the IDS and then we apply that profile based on the VM characteristics. So we just, we just, we don't always apply all the rules to every VM. We look at the VM, for example, if it's an SQL server, we're gonna apply only the critical signature for SQLs to be on that VM. That makes our IDS very effective and very performing because instead of having all the IDS rules being scanned by every VM, now every VM will profile it as an Oracle SQL because we get all this context information from the VM where tools installed, we'll be able to tell that this is an SQL server. And when we apply the policy of critical IDS signatures, we're not gonna push like 11,000 or 7,000 of rules. We're gonna only, uh, sorry, uh, signatures. We're gonna only push the signatures for SQL or for Oracle for that machine. And if that machine, if you spin on a new machine and it matches the same profile, directly the IDS will be applied. If you move a VM from one location to the other, we'll always update the state table and we'll always update the policy and we'll always reduce the policy inside the hypervisor. So one of the concerns I know that everybody will be asking, what is the performance? What's gonna be the, effect, uh, the performance impact on the hypervisor? So every ESX server host can go up to four gig 
of IPS functionality. Now, the, the, uh, the impact on the CPU, or there's no impact on the memory, let's, let's say this way, but on the CPU of the hypervisor, we don't do any resource allocation for IDS or IPS. We're gonna use the resources that are available in the hypervisor, so if we see resources available, we're gonna use them. Now, the performance impact can vary between a host and the other, so it depends on how many VMs you have or how many profiles you're applying, all this depends. But we see, we're seeing between five and 10% of performance that we need from the hypervisor to do up to 11K of signatures on the hypervisor. And that's huge, by the way, because if you compare the price of a IDS with a four gig versus what we have in, in a per host, that's gonna be a lot cheaper to go on a, in a distributed IDS instead of going on a physical IDS. Because you, have, you usually have more, more than one host in the data center. And if you calculate every host is doing four gig, so if you have a three, you have actually 12 gig of IDS throughput that you can do per, per host. So IDS can help customers do regulatory compli compliance for PCI, DSS, and HIPAA. That's one of the cases that we actually uh, benefit customers. The other thing is we don't have any more, we can actually see lateral movement of the, uh, of the attackers. So attackers usually, when they attack one of the web server using a legitimate port allowed by the distributed firewall, they start using that port to actually do some scannings and so on. So that lateral movement was not available before to the IDS because IDS was sitting on the perimeter or its concentration point. Now we can see all this lateral movement for IDS and we can stop them at the VNIC level of the virtual machine. Another thing on the long term, customer can replace their big appliances. Instead of buying this big appliance doing IPS and IDS and firewalling, they can lower that in investment and they can lower their capex and they can use a smaller version of that uh, IDS because everything now is being done, east west being done on the hypervisor level from the firewalling and from an IDS and IPS perspective. So it's a distributed analysis, so we are gonna have more throughput because every host is doing IDS. It's actually, the signatures are done based on TrustWave. So TrustWave is gonna be the commercial, it's a commercial, by the way, um, a vendor. We're using their signature, they're actually creating a specific signature for VMware because we have context information about SQL, Oracle, about a lot of things inside the VM. They're creating these signatures mainly for VMware. And as I said, they are context-based. So actually we can tell what type of software is running, what type of functionality is this VM doing. And based on this functionality and the operating system, we're gonna push the policy to that device, to that VM. And the policy is, as I said, it's actually mobile and it's actually a stateful. So you don't lose the state when you move the VM from one location to the other. Now, bare metal servers, we want NSX to become the single management, single uh, networking overlay for every customer. We are hammered big time with uh, other vendors telling us that we don't support bare metal. And honestly, we were supporting bare metal, but was mainly the Linux and the, and the SUS Linux uh, operating system. But now, so finally, we have Windows supported. So Windows 2016 is supported. We have to install an SX agent on them. Once you install the NSX agent, the first use case, if you want to block traffic between a VM and a physical appliance or a physical web, a Windows server, now we can actually push the firewall policy all the way to the Windows server. So what we do is we install the agent, we install an OBS switch. So the, the interface that is coming from the, uh, virtual, from the machine will go into the OBS switch. We program that OBS switch with the firewall policy. It's gonna be a layer four firewall for, not, for now, it's not layer seven. And then we can block traffic from this VM, from physical to physical, or from physical to a VM. Now, that server that you install the agent could be a VLAN based, so it can be VLAN backed, or it can be overlay backed. Okay, so when you install the NSX agent, you have two modes. Either you install it as an overlay, and then this server become like a transport node inside the uh, NSX. So as, as you go to nodes and you see the transport nodes, you see that server as a transport node, or you can make it VLAN based, which means that you're not gonna build overlay with NSX, but you're gonna have a segment, assign it to that, assign it to VLAN, and assign that segment to that bare method server, and now you can do micro-segmentation on a layer four level for that uh, bare method server. So these are the two first use cases, and also another use case is when you have multiple bare method servers that you want to be on the same VM VLAN, we have a lot of customers who told us we have very old servers that we cannot actually uh, change their IP addresses, and we want them to be on the same VLAN of the VM. 
that is doable with this. So we have the VM mode. And if they can do an overlay, then it's actually better for them because now the gateway can live also on the NSX. So they don't have to administer their underlay for the gateway. The operating system that we support right now is all these operating systems. Okay, and one of them is Windows 2016. Uh, when you add the node inside NSX, you see a node type, either Red Hat, Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, Server, or Windows Server. It will not tell you it's Windows 2016. You're just gonna go add a node, and then you get select Windows 2000, uh, sorry, Windows, uh, Windows Server, and then it will go and install the NSX agent. You need to have WinRM enabled on that Windows 2016 server, because we're gonna interact with this uh, service to install the agent. Now, the scale of the bare method right now in MSX is 3.0300. Uh, the VU is working on 500. It doesn't mean the limit will be 500. So we're working to increase that limit over time. So it's going to be right now 300. We're going to go to 500 and later we're going to go even beyond 500. So we have introduced as well in the dynamic, uh, sorry, in the micro segmentation, instead of going and adding the members per IP address, now we have a new member type, which is called physical service type. So when you go inside the NSX to do micro segmentation, you can go and select the members based on the physical servers. And then you see all the servers and you can add them to the membership of the group to do micro segmentation. On the distributed firewall, we have introduced something new called time-based firewall policy. Before, when you enable the firewall policy on the distributed, IP, uh, distributed firewall, it was always enabled always applicable, but we have some customers that requested this feature because of the VDI mainly. So if you have a VDI environment and you know that users are gonna use a VDI and during working hours from Sunday to Thursday, seven to seven, then you can create a rule and assign a time for that rule so that it, it will be only allowing traffic to go inside the hypervisor, inside the data center during the daytime or working hours time. And in the night, it will deny the traffic for all VDI environment. And as you know, most of the attackers, they know that it's nighttime in, in, in the Gulf, for example, or in UAE, and they do all the try, their, their, try, their attacks usually in the night because they know there's nobody monitoring the environment. So what you do is actually, as you can see here, we have a time, like a clock sign. You click on the clock sign and then you assign a time window for the policy. When the clock is green, it means you are applying a, a time policy. If it's blue, then it means that nothing is applied. Every policy can be assigned only one time group. So it would that time window, I would say, but you can use this time window for many, uh, many rules. For example, if you have a time window saying it's only during working hours, then you can use this time window for all the rules or you can create other time windows, but any rule can be assigned only to a single time window. And the way we do it is every two minutes, the, there's this, like a scheduler where it goes and check that is, uh, is this rule should be disabled or not. So if you have, for example, a rule that says from six to seven, I'm gonna allow this, you'll see it disabled at 7.02 uh, times. So because it is a two minutes delay interval. A prerequisite to enable this is NTP. If you don't have NTP, the applying of these rules will fail. You'll see instead, if you, instead of seeing successful, you see unsuccessful. So you need to have an NTP server to sync the time, otherwise you'll not be able to be, uh, to be, to be pushing firewall policy with a time-based uh, 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 time window. Okay, as you can see here, we're creating a time window, we're setting the UTC time or the local transport time, and then we can say which time, which days, and, and when it starts, when it ends, from what time to what time. The timing is increased by, by 30 minutes, so you can say 7.30, 8, 8.30, you cannot say 8.15 or 8.10. Okay. URL analysis. This is a very nice feature, by the way. I was very happy to see it. We are adding URL analysis for analysis purpose only. So now we can have from web root all the categories of all the websites are being accessed in the data center. And that's very, very, uh, I would say, beneficial for customers because now any traffic going outside your data center will be inspected and it will be telling you which website you're accessing. So we're gonna have web root. We're gonna get all the information from web root. We're gonna download it to the VMware cloud. And then we can have these reputation filtering and reputation, uh, I would say, uh, the scores for every domain that being accessed to the internet. So one thing to note here is for VDI environment, that's very, very important because if a customer 
have a VDI environment that's going to be very beneficial because VDI desktop sits inside the data center. And now we can monitor what users are trying to access from their VDI environment. So we'll give you a full reporting about every domain, the score, the reputation, and then we give you this type of view where you can see in this view actually who is accessing, what is the reputation, okay, for every website, are, how many of them are critical, how many of them are green, which are trustworthy, and then we give you percentages of these traffic that's going from, the, uh, from your data center to the internet. And then you can filter all this by, as well by the URL or by the category to see who is accessing what, and then we can actually drill down to see why he's accessing these phishing websites. And we can also in the future, right now it's not possible, but in the future you can actually block these type of websites. For now, your analysis is only for analysis and reputation for, for, for customers that have mainly VDI or have anything from the data center going to the internet as web browsing, okay? So the categories you'll see, you'll see the same categories you see with any type of firewall gonna have uncategorized, which means doesn't have any category. We we'll always pull the web route for every five minutes. So every five minutes we we'll download the updated uh, categories from web route. We'll install it in our VMware cloud. And then the NSX edge will be downloading this from the, uh, from the, uh, from the VMware cloud. Now, one thing to point is for this to work, it's only applied on the T1 uplink. So that's applicable only when the traffic is leaving your T1 uplink. Otherwise, it's not going to be inspected. So if you have a T0 and you're connecting all your segment to T0, that's not a possibility. You need to have a T1 and then traffic has to cross the T1 uplink. We need to enable the, the, the DNS snooping. So what we do is we enable a rule allowing DNS any to any with DNS profile as a layer seven. And when we, the user try to access the internet, we're going to access snoop this DNS request. We're going to send it to our VMware cloud to check if there's a category for it. And based on the category, we're going to send the reporting to the uh, uh, NSX manager. So we have 80 plus type of predefined categories. You can set the profile per edge. So you can say on this cluster of edge, I'm going to not monitor, for example, weapons. I'm going to monitor all other websites. So it's up to you to do uh, the uh, profile per edge. And as I said, this is applied per edge cluster. It has to be a medium edge cluster or large edge cluster and it has to be as well uh, on the T1 router. Anything that's low, low score, it means high risk. You're gonna see a risk score for every reputation. 21 to 40 is gonna be suspicious and so on. Similar what you have to, you see in a normal firewall that you have inside your data center. As I said, we're gonna pull the web route every five minutes. So every five minutes we'll get everything, we'll download to the VMware cloud service. The NSX edge node management interface should have internet access. And right now we don't support proxy. So that management interface of the edge should have internet access because it's gonna go to the VMware cloud, download the latest definitions or the latest database and save it on the edge node. So every edge node will have a cache. Not every request will go all the way to the cloud. So as long as the cache is up to date and we match the rule, we're gonna use the cache. If you don't match the rule, we're gonna try and request this from VMware cloud service and the VMware cloud service requested from WebGroup. Okay, as I said, this is just a simulation. The user will have a, maybe got a phishing email saying access this website. And he clicks on the link, which is space CX plus. The traffic will go from the VM. It will go all the way as a DNS request first. So it's gonna be a DNS query. Here on the uplink of that tier one, we're gonna enable a DNS snooping. So once we enable DNS snooping, it's gonna send the response to get, once it gets the response, it's gonna check this website in the cache, and then it will get the reputation for this website. And then based on that, it will deny or allow the, uh, sorry, it will give you some profiling about the traffic that's happening uh, on, the, on the internet traffic, on the HTTP traffic. So during the HTTP establishment, we will create the reputation and we we'll get everything monitored. And then we met, we, every five minutes, we send an update for NSX manager to update their the GUI interface for the reporting. The, the, insta the, the enablement of URL analysis is very easy. Just enable the NS snooping, okay? And then you enable a pro uh, the URL analysis in, 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 on the edge, and then you configure a profile, and then you start monitoring the URL analysis. As I said, you need to have a medium, uh, medium uh, type of, uh, medium type of, uh, uh, of edge cluster. It cannot be a small edge cluster because we have to initiate 
a services instance. So we need to have the medium instance for that. Now, North-South net network introspection. Before, we used to have network, network introspection east-west. And for network introspection east-west, you used to be able to do service training. So you can send the traffic to multiple uh, service endpoints to do inspection. For you can send it to one NG firewall, another NG firewall, and then to net Gigamon, for example, we used to do service training. On the uplink of the, of the T0, we were not able to do this. We were not able only to do service training, one, per one service training only. So we will be able to do service training only to one type of uh, service endpoint that we have, for example, in that NG firewall. However, in the NSX 3.0, now we can do on the North Pulse as well, service training to multiple services endpoints. So you can send it to one NG firewall, another NG firewall, and then you can send it also to a Gigamon, for example. So service training on the North South is, in, is improved, and now we can do service training as well on the North South, not only East West. Operation enhancements. So before in NSX T2.5, we had the, the problem of the NICs. So if you remember, if a customer had two port NICs, he used to have it for VDS. And then when you install NSX, we used to tell him, you either need to migrate all your VM kernels to NVDS, or give us another two uplinks for dedicated for NVDS, which is for NSX NVDS. That was a problem for customers. Many customers had a problem giving you more ports because they didn't have more ports on the server. And even if they had more ports on the server, they may not have enough ports on the top of rack switches. So what we ended up doing is we tell him, okay, we use your existing two ports that you have on your NSX uh, ESX server, but now we have to migrate all the VM kernels interfaces to NVDS. And not all the customers are happy to run their VM kernels on the MVDS because they think if that NSX is down, how can they access the web server, the management interface of that uh, ASX server? And that was also cumbersome for the clients. And it's very, as well, more complicated to deploy. So in, in vCenter, you would see multiple type of port groups. You would see the standard port group. You will see the distributed port group. And you'll see also the NSX, what we call opaque port group. All these were type of port groups and also it was creating more confusion for customer, which port group is what. And they, some of them don't know the difference in the icon, so they didn't know which one is created by NSX, which one created by VSS, or which one created by DVS. In NSX 3.0, if you have an existing customer that has VDS 7.0 and VSP 7.0, we can actually use the same VDS, we can actually use the same port groups, so we don't have to ask for a new VM mix, and we don't have to migrate the VM kernel anymore. So the same VDS, we're just gonna install the libraries for NSX, and then we can use it as an overlay. That will make the deployment simpler. We don't want to request more ports. We don't want to migrate any VM kernel interfaces and cause any downtime for the customers. Okay, now one thing to note, VDS v7 requires vSphere 7. vSphere 7 is not compatible or does not have the libraries for NSX 2.5. So NSX 2.5 is not supported under vSphere 7. If you're gonna go to NSX 3.0 with vSphere 7, you need first of all to upgrade to NSX 3.0, and then you upgrade your environment from vSphere 6.7 to vSphere 7. One thing you have improved as well in the tagging. So now in the inventory, you'll see some a tag called tags, and now you can see every tag and who is assigned to this tag. The problem we had before is if we have, let's say, 100 VMs and we want to assign a tag for every VM, we had to go to every VM, click on it, click edit, add the tag, and then submit. Now with this improved uh, inventory, what we can do is we can go to the tag, okay? We can go and select the virtual machine. We can say set virtual machines. And once we set the virtual machine, you see all the virtual machine available, and then you can just check box here, select them all, and say for each, all these servers, I'm gonna actually uh, assign them the tag of production. So instead of going one by one, you'll be able to do it in one click from the inventory. Another thing we improved is the uh, filtering. So now we can filter based on scope, based on source, based on tag. That was not possible before. So once you apply the filter, you only see the VMs that are applied the filter. And the other thing is we now support auto continuation of the comments. So if let's say you're gonna add a tag, and many times you add a tag and you make a mistake, but now we can show, we can show you what are the tags available inside or discovered in the, in the NSX environment. 
And that's very handy, by the way, when you do NSX Cloud, because the cloud has a big tag. It's called DIS, which is discovered, and then colon, and then Azure, and then something else. Instead of you memorizing what are the tags from the cloud, you can just type DIS, and it will show you everything that has been discovered or everything in the inventory, and then you can select it. And once you select it, you can use it also for the criteria for the grouping. So we have this type autocomplete. So now we can autocomplete anything you type in the tags. We have added also uh, the possibility to import IP addresses and export IP addresses. We had multiple customers asking if we're going to add a lot of IP addresses, how can we add them? And they, it was prone to error because you're adding them manually. Now we can support a CSV file to actually upload the via Excel sheet or CSV file all the IP addresses and use them in NSX. There's something new in 3.0 as well. Service training, I spoke about it briefly before. Uh, so before we used to be able to do service training for MD firewall, IPS, and Gigamon only for east-west traffic. So anything that's going east-west within the virtual machines. When we used to do it on the uplink, it was only limited to one type of service training, either MD firewall or IPS or Netmon. In the current version, we'll be able to actually do service training for all the three together, even for north-south traffic. So even the traffic is coming from out to in, we'll be able to do service training of multiple type of uh, NG, uh, type of service endpoints. So if you look at the service training, what happens is traffic will come from the uplink. It will hit the T0. Once it hits the T0, it will match the classifier to go to service training of NG firewall IPS netmon. It will go to all these. Once it's done, it will go back to the destination. So we can do support service training on the uplink of the gateways T0 now. Another thing we have improved is alarms. Alarms, something what was not available in 2.5. Now we can see all the alarms that are happening. We have severity for these alarms. We can set thresholds for these alarms and we can set SNMP tracks. So here you can see all the triggered alarms that we have inside the, uh, inside the NSX. And we have severity for every alarm where you can click on that severity and you can see what is happening for this, uh, for this device or for this edge or this transport code. One thing you can see is as well here on the alarms, you're gonna see in every gateway a new tab, it's called alarms. If you look, if this was an alarm, you see if it's yellow, green, or red. If it's red, it means it's critical. You can directly click from this link and you can go to the alarm that's happening on the gateway or the edges or segments or anything. So now we have alarms mapped all the way to the uh, function or to the elements inside NSX. So just to summarize, sorry, I'm running quickly, but because we have limited time, uh, we have improved NSX 3.0 big time. It's becoming the most mature and most uh, robust uh, version that we have from NSX. We continue to develop a lot of new features on NSX 3.0. So lead with NSX 3.0 if you have a green field or brown field environment. As long as the customer can go to vSphere 7, it's highly recommended to use VDS instead of using the NVDS because on the long run, what we see is the NCBU will move away from NVDS and probably we're gonna deprecate or stop supporting NVDS in the future. That's it for me, Quinton. If you wanna go start your uh, lab, please go ahead. Oh, I'm just answering some questions here as well. Uh, I think we got through most of it. Uh, the last one, can we create DVS switch? So there was one question here. Can I create a, a version six or 5.5 DVS in vSphere seven? Um, let's try. All right, thanks very much, man. That was, you had about 10,000 more slides than I had. I didn't realize there was so much in, in that patch. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my slides going? So what I thought I'd do is give you a quick uh, demonstration. I think we're actually doing quite well for time. We might even finish before the hour and a half. So what I do, thought I'd do, I'd do a demonstration, just a, a run through actually what this federation setup looks like. What does the global manager look like? How do you browse around things? Uh, I, 
I have a, some test VMs running in this system to generate traffic for IDS. So I can show you the dashboard, show you some alarms that have been raised. Um, the question on the VDS, I know that you can create at least a 6.7 VDS in the 7 release uh, because I set this up yesterday in our lab. We can check now what versions it supports. One thing I will tell you is that when you are using vSphere 7.0 and the VDS with NSX 3.0, today we do not support uh, vSAN, at least 6.7 vSAN with NSX 3.0 enabled uh, NVDS. So if you're going to, if you have a vSAN environment and you're host still on 6.7, do not prep those hosts with NSX 3.0. It is not supported. We, I spent a um, full day yesterday trying to see why my vSAN is not working on one cluster to find out that it's actually not supported. That is specifically vSAN in, in a vS switch with 6.7. In 7.0, it works fine. My environment, uh, these ESXi compute clusters you see here, uh, is running vSAN. I have a to PNIC host just using the VDS. So let's have a look. Can you see my screen? You see the lab setup? We can see your screen. Should I zoom in or is this uh, font big enough? I think if you can zoom in, it's better. Like this or more? More. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. That is okay. fine. Cool. So I'll first show you from a vCenter standpoint, everything you see here is running on uh, 7.0. You'll see my compute and edge clusters and the edge VMs that have been deployed. From the compute cluster standpoint, it's running uh, vSAN. All of that is working. Uh, if, if we go to the host configurations from a network standpoint, the first thing you'll see is the adapters are connected to a VDS, which I configured and created inside vCenter. The VM kernel adapters are also on that uh, VDS. When I prepared the host for NSX using the dashboard inside NSXT, it adds this extra VM, uh, VM kernel interface, which is the TEP. And then there's this hyperbus Honestly, I have not figured out what that is. I don't know if this is for agentless antivirus. This is my guess. It's the agent antivirus VM I need to check it. So from a switch perspective, uh, there's the version seven switch. You can see it over there. I think on site two, yeah. So site two, oh, it was, it's removed. I had another cluster here that had a version 6.7, let's see if it's been removed. Oh, here it is. So there's a 6.6 .6 reports it as. So there's the answer to the question, the, the oldest VDS you can use is 6.5 in, in vSphere 7.0. Uh, okay, so let's go to the NSX dashboard. So when you go to NSX dashboard, you now have two options. Let me just capture my password. You can either log into the global manager or you can still continue to log into the local managers. Oh man. The benefit of logging into the global manager is obviously that I can bounce around between global and local, but from local, I cannot go back to global if I just logged in locally to the local manager. So from the first thing you will notice here is uh, something that is disappeared is the, what is used to be called the advanced UI. It doesn't show up here. I'll show you where that's moved to. But I have this drop down menu here, which is taking me to the, either the global view or to the local manager, which is uh, 
for site one, data center one. The you have a new tab on the top right here, which is policy, which is the new UI that you see, or manager, which is the legacy UI interface. Although the look and feel is the same, but it will configure via the old API. So if we go back to the global manager, you will now have the option to do T0s and T1s and segments that when you are configuring them here, let's call it VMark. Depending how you're connecting it to a T0 or T1, you might have the flexibility to actually do it across multiple sites or maybe odds and even sites, whatever. But in my case, this T0 is stretched across both sites. So in the slightly in the dark gray here, you can see this DC1, DC2. So when I attach this segment to that T1, it is going to be configured across both uh, networks. So I'm going to just give it a test IP here. So this is going to go away to NSX, uh, or NSX manager is going to go to vCenter. It will create the DV port group uh, matching that VMAG demo, and it is going to do it across both sides. So if I refresh here, you see the port group in site one, and you see the same port group in site two. So very similar to the experience you had in Across vCenter, when you created a logical net, a universal logic network, except yeah, it is called the same everything in both sides. It's not I have some unique numbers per site, so the logic is easy to follow. So now I've basically added a, a layer three subnet to that T1 across the two sites. So from a T0 deployment perspective. In this today, we only support the edge um, appliance in active active. So when you deploy the edge nodes for the cluster, they will be in active active. That means no stateful service on the T0 in 3.0. Uh, you add your locations to the setup and then you would have pre-configured or pre-deployed the edge VMs and edge clusters in the local manager but then you will just point to that edge clusters and then assign them either primary or secondary. So we will support multiple topologies, active standby, active active, all that kind of stuff. In my setup here, I have just done it uh, active standby. So data center one is active, data center two is standby. Something to take note in uh, NSX 2.5 multi-site pre-federation where we could, one NSX manager is doing deployment across two sites and I'm stretching a T0. When I assigned my remote site as a secondary site, we automatically did an AS prepend on BGP to force that data to be uh, the secondary site. In federation, it is not happening automatically. You have to go and do that AS prepend uh, using root map and stuff like that. So I've done some setup here using root maps. You'll see on BC2 out is the is the one where I'm doing the. I'm just doing a. Adding one AS number to that uh, advertising to force the path primary on site A. The interesting piece here is the is obviously the interfaces, because now I have four edge VMs acting as the T0, two of them in site A, two of them in site, or two of them in site one, two in site two. Each one has their own uh, dual uplinks going to a, a switch. So I've configured four uplinks. You attach the uplinks, you attach it to a location, which maps to a logical uh, VLAN or something that you've created in NSX as a segment. So this will be a VLAN ID connecting to, 
So we'll just refresh that. So think of this as one big logical router across the sites with four uplinks. So from the network standpoint, you are going to get four routing updates because you have four BGP neighbors for the same nub for the same subnet. And I can just quickly show you that. So it might not be too visible on the screen, but you can see yeah, I'm, re I'm learning that update. Can you the uh, content or because the text is small on the party and on the NSX, please? Okay. Oh, yeah. So NSX, I need to. Sorry, I didn't realize. Okay. So that should be a little. Is that better on the NSX screen? Thanks. So the party, I just wanted to show you that I'm learning the routes, but if I did a show IPBGP for that subnet, you'll see that I am actually have four entries but because of this ASP page. So again, so you've centralized the routing and uh, networking configuration, and the same goes for the actual uh, security perspective. Today, IDS is not in the Federation dashboard. It is only the distributed firewall and gateway firewall. IDS, IPS would follow. So now you would have a global, like you used to have a universal uh, section in NSXV, you now have this global policy section and you configure global policies. And this global policy can have security groups which are configured as uh, global or you can mix and match with local security groups so from the global manager you will s it will be exposed to all the security groups tags everything you've done across all the environment and you can inherit those and mix and match them uh, so the look and feel of the dashboard is very similar from global to local. There is some services that you could potentially do on the T1 level, which I've done in this one, because only the T0 is active active. Uh, let's take a look now at a local site. Oh, sorry, let me, I actually wanted to show you something in the global. So one of the new features we have, which is actually, yes. Yeah, so, uh, one of the new features that I, we mentioned earlier was the topology view. So now when you go to networking, you get the overview dashboard that gives you your summary of all your PGP neighbors, uh, all the stuff you've configured, segments, routing, whatever. But now you have this cool feature called topology view. And I can go look at my topologies and how things are connected. So in this setup, I have uh, created a T0 for my VRFs. So this is a, the VRF feature is also not available in Federation today. It's a local feature. So I created an additional set of T0 at, at edge cluster, edge nodes with a cluster and a T0 with two VRFs. So this is 10 and one and 10 and two, so if I go a little bit closer, you actually now see the names, you see the uh, uplinks on the T1. So you can see all the IPs are different, it's unique. The tenants can have overlapping IPs, doesn't matter. I just put same or unique IPs so that I can actually connect to them. Uh, an interesting part is if you leave it as default configuration, when this VM talks to that VM, it will follow the path going up to the T0, external uplinks to either a firewall or router, or whatever you have on that side, and come back down. But we have the capabilities to add a static route to actually route from one VRF to another without having to leave the environment. Now that would be used with caution, especially if, and in your own environment, yes, in a multi-tenancy environment, a source provider, obviously you don't want that to happen. Uh, you'll see another little segment here. 
I actually have a load balancer, a one-armed load balancer configured in this tenant. So that is the, the T1 for that load balancing service. If I go over to this side, you see my global topology. So that's the T0 with those four edge VMs across the two sides. And these are the segments and VMs and stuff attached to it. So there's the segment I just added. This week I was helping somebody uh, with a setup where we had some challenges to figure out because they'd done some configurations before I got on. And we actually used the topology view to figure out what it is they've done and where they've connected it and why the mistake. So it is pretty useful. I think uh, it gives you a lot more insight of what has happened. You can drill down and stuff like that. So the other one, let's go look at security. So from the dashboard side, the first thing you'll notice is intrusion, uh, intrusion detection, the URL analysis, and distributed firewall. So I have not enabled URL analysis in my setup yet. So there's nothing to show here, but if I go to data center two, where I have the IDS running, So I have a VM that has been that has some data that it keeps replaying, which is actually a bunch of uh, well-known attacks uh, and things that the, the VM is trying to do. And uh, you can see all the attempts from my different machines. I have some victims. I have a meta spoiled uh, VM that I'm actually simulating some attacks and doing some stuff to create some alarms. So this is just your general dashboard you can drill down into the uh, distributed IDS dashboard and this is where all the logs are spotted today in the environment and all these that are flashing it unfortunately looks like coronavirus or something you can go drill down into that and actually see what was that flow who's the attacker what is the target the protocol details the time of the event and an IDS rule that's associated to this. So Muhammad spoke about how to implement this. Uh, there's some standard settings. You'll start off by enabling either the updates. So the updates can be an automatic update. That means the NSX manager either needs internet access or access via proxy. In my setup, I just have direct access so it will automatically update it. You can then either enable it on a standalone host or enable it on the clusters. So we spoke earlier about the licensing. You would have to have a additional license for IDS, IBS for, with minimum advanced and enterprise support. Uh, then what you do is you have the rules configuration. Well, let's go to profiles first. You have some profiles that are built in and then you can customize profiles so yeah, I have a profile that is called IDS. So I'm just basically taking all the levels of signatures into that profile. And another one that is just critical and high. And then I'm going to go and create some rules of how to apply this policy. So I created a security group called IPS Applications. It's basically just looking for all the VMs that are attached to a segment where I have attached this uh, virtual machine that is, uh, is screening the simulated data or, and the actual compromised hosts and stuff like that. So it means all the VMs on that segment, these are the IPs that are detected from all those VMs, will be applied as a source and any communication that they are talking to, I will apply the profile which I created for all signatures. So it doesn't matter which uh, VM it is, all the signatures will trigger uh, an event if, they, if it matches an event. And then just some mix and match of how to do it. But the output is this dashboard. It has some filtering capabilities. So you can go and filter to attack targets, VMs, known vulnerabilities, a virtual machine name, and then filter down into uh, what you want to see. But you can also go and if you look at uh, an event, 
you can see some history on this. Just realized my videos. So I can go look in the logs, what is happening here. So we also support having this exported to something like Splunk. Uh, we will continue integrating with all different vendors. You will have the capabilities to do custom signatures, uh, all these kind of nice details. So today, this is just the IDS. So we're just creating the actual um, detection alarm. We're not actually doing any action with us. We plan to do IPS and then potentially see how we integrate that with NSX. So maybe quarantine VMs, that kind of features and functions. Cool. Let me see what else is there. Maybe let's open it up to some questions. And then, oh, the other one, somebody asked me earlier about VR9. So VR9 is also has NSXT support. So you can go to NSX and then we'll see all the different NSX managers that we have in our setup. If I open it. Something bombed off. Ah, no, that was there. So you see the summary of the NSXT inventory. I've got a poll. Uh, something else I would show you guys, uh, talking with there was some questions about Kubernetes and stuff. In VR and I, there's this uh, integrated plugin for Kubernetes. Uh, I've been working with my colleagues yesterday and today, or actually the last week, to set up a, uh, this new vSphere integrated Kubernetes platform, and they integrated it with Vero and I today. So yeah, you can see all the namespaces and stuff like that. So this is also running on an NSX environment. And then, uh, we have a question. Do we support VROps to monitor NSXT directly? or it has to be VROps running in NM60. Do you have an answer? I don't believe there's a data pack for NSXT in VROps. So there used to be this data pack uh, for what was used to be for NSXV, but I've actually not tried it in VROps to be honest. But I, I, we did not do any further development on that data pack for some time. Okay. But for log insight, if I go open log insight, log insight actually has a data pack specifically for NSXT. So you'll see a uh, is an NSXT data pack in log insight. Since this is a lab, there will be some errors. And I'm sure in your environment, you never see any errors. Uh, I'm open to any questions or anything else that I might not have showed you that we thought we would show you. I can show you Quentin, uh, Yeah, just one comment here, Quentin. Um, I was checking now the NSX T pack for uh, for VROPS. Yeah. Uh, as I see, uh, starting from VROPS 8.1, it's native now to VROPS. So there's no need to add it externally. 
Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. That's true. Thanks. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Thank you. There I'm is any text here? Yeah. Okay, I'll try it later. So, uh, one thing I will show you the VRF uh, configurations. So I have a T0, which I, I create as the master or the, for the, at least the master of the, v, the VRFs. And then within that, uh, once I have that, I can now add a VRF, call it demo, VMOG. I attach it to a T0, which in this case, I only have one T0 doing it. It will inherit all the settings from that T0. So I only have one edge appliance applied. And there I have a new VRF configured. Now I can go and add a T1 to it and add my uplink interfaces. In the, that, there's some fine print for the uplink interfaces, but we can cover this in a, in a more detailed session. Because basically this edge VM where it lives, it needs to have a trunk port on the physical server because you need to pass all these sub interfaces as trunk interface or as VLAN trunks uh, down that trunk to the uplink switch. So there's a way of putting the actual VLAN that needs to be encapsulated on this uplink interface on one of the segments. But if we go to the topology view now, we will see that Is my new VRF. So this one, okay. Name of VMOG VRF. Okay, guys, ladies. Is there anybody else that wants to open question over the mic or? Anything uh, that's still in chat that needs to be answered. One question that answered is the uh, the policy view versus manager view. Yes. So the policy view. So if you know in NXX was it two dot four two dot five where we came out with this um, declarative view or declarative policy that we create policies. Uh, in a much more simpler way that you can create a T0, a switch, firewall policies, everything in one API call as opposed to multiple calls. So, and then we showed the dashboard, I don't have it here, but we used to show something called the advanced networking and security, which was the original NSXT dashboard. That is now sits in the actual manager icon. If you're using VRA or something, on top of NSXT, like VRA 7 or 4, whatever, it is talking to this UI interface. So yeah, you can see that old look and feel of NSXT. But what they've done, and I think it was quite nice, is they hid away that advanced networking there to stop people from getting confused. And they just made it policy and manager. Ideally, we will land up just with policy. Uh, we spoke earlier about Active Directory. So if I go to, where is it? Oh yeah. Under users and roles, you now have the option to active, to add your Active Directory. So I've integrated this into our lab Active Directory and then created some local users you can see myself as an LDAP user from the fabric standpoint. So there's a question earlier about if we are moving to VDS, uh, is there no dependency on vCenter? What we found uh, most customers, if not all customers that are using NSX with uh, vSphere environment, the first thing they did was come and add the, the 
vCenter into the, into the dashboard so that they can actually expose the compute environment. So yes, you will be tied to vCenter, but what we've seen it is shouldn't be a, a train smash because this is what our customers are used to. We will continue to maintain NVDS for the KVM and uh, yeah, KVM environments. Oh, one thing I will show you. I spoke earlier, uh, there was a question about the tunnel endpoint interface. So what is new in uh, 3.0 with this federation? You'll see my edge VM here has a tunnel endpoint. So this is the tunnel endpoint for the encapsulated data. But we've added an additional interface to this edge VM. The data that is going from a VM in site A to the data that is or VM in site B does not use the host tunnel endpoint, but instead that data is being pushed from the edge VM to edge VM. So the edge VM itself now has a new interface. Oops. Uh, where is it? Not sure. Where did it go? Ah, yeah, it's coming up. Sorry, it's a bit slow. Where is my art? I'm just trying to see where it went. I'll find it. But so there's a is a third uh, tunnel interface which is now called the RTEP. Maybe it's the same from the global manager. Let me check it. All right, while I find this, let's see if there's any other questions. But just to answer the question there was, that it is, there's an additional tunnel endpoint interface on the edge nodes that is doing the site-to-site -site data transport. Here we go. No? No, no, I can't find it. Sorry, shouldn't we check in my transport mode? Oh, you're right. There it is. I was looking on the edge house. Sorry. <laughs> I was looking in the edge uh, ESXi host and not the actual edge VM. That makes more sense. I thought this looks weird. Okay, here we go. So there's tunnels. Thanks for that. So these are my local tunnels. So, and then there's our RTEP remote tunnel endpoint that has a configuration. So this is the RTEP, yeah. And this is the local tunnel. So there's this additional tunnel interface here. We will cover this, I think, in a future session. We will do a more detailed design discussion and routing and everything on Federation. Cool. I think we have reached the time now. If there's any other questions, feel free. Then how many how many sites is supported by a global manager? Uh, today it's three in the existing release. Okay. But this will increase to at least eight in the next release. Uh -huh.
Thank you, Ben. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is that on the so a nice thing about this federation and the side-to-side -side communication. Uh, one thing that we do support on this up this tunnel input tunnel interface is um, fragmentation. So you don't have this requirement for the 1600 byte MTU. In my setup here, I'm using a 1600 byte MTU because there was a bug in 3.0 in the in the initial release, where you have to use 1600. But the default of this uh, remote tunnel endpoint is actually 1500. So ideally, you want to have it not fragmenting, but you now have the capabilities to do this multi-site with routing and firewalling everything, even traffic sending across without having to force the customer or force your environment to have uh, jumbo or oversized uh, into you. Cool. Uh, Quinton, I believe we reached yeah. the end of the session, okay? So just before you guys go, um, I'd like just to share, you know, the result of the poll, you know, that we posted on the, um, uh, on the Zoom session, okay? Um, now, most importantly, you know, regarding our uh, sessions in Ramadan, I believe most of you have actually um, suggested, you know, to have the sessions between uh, 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., okay? So um, um, I believe, you know, we believe in democracy, you know, so we have to go with the majority. Uh, but hopefully also this timing is aligned, you know, with our, uh, you know, speaker's availability as well, okay? Uh, the second point also regarding the um, most uh, topics, you know, that uh, requested. Um, top one is the NSXT 3.0 deep dive. Um, I believe we'll have definitely future sessions uh, focusing on specific, you know, features uh, as a follow up, you know, after this session. Uh, secondly, vSphere 7, I believe the next session would be covering vSphere 7 as an overview. Um, uh, coming in third place is uh, Kubernetes 101. I will definitely uh, arrange uh, something like this in the near future. So if you guys have any more questions, suggestions, you can send it to us uh, on any of our channels, you know, that Rajas already shared with you. And uh, we wish you um, um, Ramadan Kareem. You know, this is the official Ramadan greeting. And uh, hopefully we see you soon in the uh, next session. Uh, whether you are from UAE or actually from any nearby uh, time zone. Thank you very much, Marwan. Thank you guys for joining uh, and have a good evening and stay safe. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Many thanks to Sita and Muhammad as well, you know, for being with us today. Pleasure, man. No worries. Pleasure. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.